Hi, David Rosenberg here for the Psychopharmacology Institute. In this CAP, or Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Smart Take, we'll take a close look at a clinical dilemma increasingly facing those of us treating children and especially adolescents. Namely, what do we do when we see children and adolescents with ADHD and co occurring cannabis use? This is a great think piece, not a controlled study, that uses an informative, well written case history to discuss all of the medical, psychiatric, psychological, cognitive, societal, social, legal, and state by state issues that arise in this population. And the case report really does a nice job of illustrating what's involved in these assessments and treatment decisions. The recommendations and analyses provided by Dernbach and colleagues are timely and especially helpful for this increasingly common clinical dilemma facing all of us working with children and adolescents. We know that ADHD is a severe highly prevalent, often chronically disabling childhood onset neuropsychiatric disorder that persists into adulthood. We also know that co-occurring cannabis use, as well as nicotine or cigarette smoking, is far more common in adolescents with ADHD than in adolescents in the general non-ADHD population. On the flip side, chronic cannabis use that starts in childhood or adolescence is associated with long-term problems with attention, concentration, cognition, impulse control, executive planning, long-term planning, and even intellectual ability. And there's a clear concern about cannabis use worsening pre-existing attention and cognitive symptoms in youth with ADHD. Further complicating this already complicated picture is that untreated ADHD is associated with increased cannabis use. There's also growing evidence that effectively treating ADHD decreases the risk of youth developing substance use disorders. Stimulants are the most common and first-line treatment for ADHD in youth, but stimulant misuse, selling stimulants, using stimulants for inappropriate indications is common and appears to be increasing I've been contacted frequently by parents, colleagues, friends in many situations where they ask me if I can prescribe their child or teenager typically a stimulant medicine, even though they have no history of ADHD. And some are very direct about wanting it to perform their child's performance on standardized testing like the SAT or ACT, their school performance. And I'll tell you, I've never done that because these medicines can do enormous good when they're prescribed correctly. But when you start taking shortcuts, when you prescribe them, when they're not indicated for what I would term this a quick fix, that's where you get into trouble. Now, I always tell parents that I'd be happy to assess their child or teenager. And if there's a medical or psychiatric condition, I'd be happy to treat it and make treatment recommendations, but in good conscience, I'm not able to prescribe a stimulant based on a parent request for improvement on standardized testing or other academic endeavors. So the bottom line here is that there remains this uncertainty for how we treat and intervene for youth with ADHD and co-occurring cannabis use, and that's only going to increase. And in some ways, you might argue that it gives us more latitude to go with our clinical intuition and experience, and that because there are so few guidelines, but we also have to be cautious and can't ignore the uncertainty and challenge in treating this population. It's also important that the physician consider local, state, legal restrictions and requirements when adolescents are using either recreational or prescribed marijuana to uh, someone else regarding disclosure, reporting requirements of substance use, cannabis use to parents, guardians, and others. 
from my take, it often comes down to a risk benefit. And if there's clear medical psychiatric danger to self or others and other risks, then breaking confidentiality may be necessary. But there's a fine line and there can be differences on a state by state basis, other local areas in terms of what the fine line is and how this can be done. So don't try and guess on this. There are resources and people to check with about this. Motivational enhancement interviewing can also be extraordinarily helpful in this population to help gauge the adolescent's insight into how cannabis use could confound and complicate treating ADHD. And motivational interviewing approaches are really preferable to confrontation and giving direct advice, particularly in the adolescent population. There's no question that abstinence from cannabis should be considered, and it's a reasonable goal, but not being abstinent from cannabis doesn't necessarily preclude use in youth with ADHD. If there is cannabis use, that obviously might lead the prescribing clinician to consider alternatives to stimulant treatment. To decrease the risk of non-medical use, selling stimulants and diversion of stimulants, particularly the immediate release stimulants, the clinician can consider non-stimulant medicines. We do know that long-acting stimulants have a lower risk of abuse than do the immediate release stimulants. Close monitoring for ongoing substance use, abuse, getting urine, drug screens, clearly warranted. And sometimes it's best to refer these patients to dual diagnosis programs where both the ADHD and substance use concerns can be managed. So the bottom line is that this is a growing concern. It's only going to increase. All clinicians need to have this on their radar as there are significant clinical, prognostic, medical, psychiatric, psychological, legal, state-by-state -state issues that have to be considered. And it's an area where more study and focus is urgently needed on this increasingly common clinical dilemma faced by all of us who work with adolescents.